great to have you, Genevieve, for you are a, a type of role model in the ICT world. What is your advice to a lot of uh, women that could certainly make this uh, excellent journey that you did? I mean, I think it's interesting that you describe it as lonely, because I think for me it was lonely in unexpected ways. Uh, not only am I a woman in the tech field, it's also been different for me because I'm a social scientist by training, not an engineer. So I came into this field in a very different kind of way. And I think sometimes that was a real advantage because I had come through a university system where there were a lot more women in the social sciences than there were in engineering. And I think by the time I got to Intel, which is where I, I, I now work, um, I think I didn't occur to me that I was going to be the only, <laughs> the only woman in the room. And I think I always treated it like it was both um, a bit of an adventure and then also um, that you didn't want to get it wrong because there were other women who the opportunity you needed to make it for them too, right? Intel has quite a positive reputation in um, just uh, taking advantage of women in their organization. What is different from uh, other ones? So there's a couple of American tech companies that have really been committed to diversity over the last couple of years. I mean, I think that the kind of the really significant one is IBM, and their commitment to diversity is over 100 years old. I mean, they had their first programs for African-American employees back in the 1880s and 1890s. And you can see those coming to fruition now if you look at the senior executive ranks at IBM. I mean, Intel's a much newer company. We've only been around for 40 years, but for the last, I'd say six or seven years since Paul Adelini's been CEO, he's been incredibly committed to making diversity an important part of the experience of the company. And he's committed to it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the right thing to do. But the second one, I think, for him is that it's made a big difference in how we make decisions. It turns out when you have more experiences in the room, a greater range of perspectives, a greater range of kind of ways of being in the world, you get better answers. And so we've had a really strong commitment to both having women in the technical ranks, so in our kind of engineering ranks, but also in our executives. So we actually have a significant number of women vice presidents as well as women technologists. Genevieve, it's not only a matter of win-win. Um, it's far more than win-win, isn't it? And um, it is also a lot of uh, challenges for uh, the female part of our population. Um, could you tell a bit more what they have to be aware of? What are the challenges? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I think in some ways I'm more aware of it than many. I mean, I'm the child of a single parent. My mom dropped out of school when she was quite young, married early, had a couple of kids very quickly, and then went back, finished high school when she was in her 20s and university, the whole nine yards. So I kind of grew up in a a family where my mom was doing it pretty hard, right? I mean, those were hard, yeah. hard experiences for her. And I think she taught me from a very early age to know that you had to fight for things and that some things were going to be a sacrifice and some things were going to be a struggle. But that it was also really important that you knew what you wanted. And I think when I sort of look at the women who work for me and the ones I mentor, I think I'm always really clear of saying, listen, it's always going to be a set of trade-offs, right? In any given moment, you're going to be focusing on one thing, not everything. And I think you just have to be aware what the balance is over, in some ways, the arc of your lifetime. I mean, I think you know we beat ourselves up a lot about the fact that we don't have it all or that we're not having whatever work-life balance is, a phrase I find very confusing. <laughs> but I think sort of imagining that over a period of one's life, it's always going to be different sets of priorities, right? There'll be times when you prioritize kids and family, when you prioritize work looking after aging parents or new babies, or looking after friends and family, or being really incredibly committed to a job or a career or a life in politics or in public policy, right? And I think any one of those moments means a series of constant trade-offs. And I think sometimes you've got to learn to be a little bit better to yourself about making those trade-offs. But you should be aware in an earlier stage that you need to build on that mm -hmm. uh, type of uh, uh, filling in of your life. What is your advice to the young uh, girls, so to say? I, mean, I think I'm incredibly lucky. I mean, yeah, I grew up in a, in a time where it was okay to imagine that you would have kids or not, and that you would have a job or not, and that there were a lot of opportunities and options, and how you chose to balance those in your own life was, I think, easier for me than for my mother's generation. The advice to young women for me is, I think it's two things, right? One is that you've got to be willing to invest in yourself and know what you want for you. Um, and also then you know what that means for your family, your community, the things that matter. Because frankly, it's not always just about you as an individual, right? But I think you've got to know what you want for you. And I think that means that you have to be investing in yourself, whether that means in your education, in your social network, 
in your community, in the institutions that matter, whether that's church or local councils or the arts, because I think all of those things become important through mm -hmm. the arc of your lifetime. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I come from a family of women who routinely live to be 100. So I'm not even halfway through my life yet, <laughs> imagining that there's going to be a much longer period for me of things I want to get done and things I want to do. And knowing that that is mean sort of having invested all the way through your life. But I tell you, I think, I think the thing that's most important to me at least is maintaining an, an air of being curious about things, of maintaining a de sort of desire to, to, to be engaged by the world, a sense of wonder, of not ever having a moment where you're kind of not interested in anything. And I think, you know, over a lifetime you get to be interested in lots of things. I mean, you're a prime example of that. You get to have a lot of different moments in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And so investing in all of that is kind of, for me, really important. What is your view on quotas? Because when we are <laughs> aware that it takes eternal life, so to say, to fill in a balanced picture, and I don't believe in eternal life, and what is your... Uh, I sometimes think in order to change behaviours, you have to set goals. Yeah. Uh, you can't ask... You, uh, you can't ask change to just happen, right? I mean, yeah. I think, you know, social change doesn't happen easily. Yeah. Social change necessitates that things will be different when it's done. And chances are the people who benefit from the way the world is currently don't necessarily want to be changed. And I think, you know, how you set up a system that actively encourages transformation and rewards it as it happens, I think is really important. And it, it looks different in different places. I mean, frankly, you know, in the lifetime of your mother and perhaps mine too, you know, what it means for women is radically different. I mean, and it's taken, it's taken 100 years, right? I mean, women got the vote first in Australia in South Australia, my hometown, in the 1880s, took to the 1920s for women to get the vote in the United mm -hmm. States, later in much of Europe. You know, we're less than 100 years in to what it means to be citizens, mm -hmm. in fact, fully emancipated citizens. So it doesn't surprise me that we're still having to push institutions to change. And then I think it always becomes a question, right, how long do you give them to change on their own before you say, yeah, we've given you yep. 20 years and you Time haven't done over. it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we might expect to see something different. My real last question. Um, taking into account the very difficult economic financial uh, situation, uh, not only in Europe, by the way, but all over the world, would it have been a different situation if more women were involved in uh, top management? I think what is more interesting to ask about this last kind of 10 or 15 year period is what if, not that it was about who was running those institutions, but what if the goals had been different? Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone through a period of kind of a very particular orientation to the market and to the power of the market. And I think we've forgotten in lots of places that markets don't always want to address certain issues. I mean, you and I both come from traditions where if you left the market to take care of everything, certain things would never have happened. And I think for me, there's always a notion of the role of government and social institutions to ensure that things that aren't represented by the market get taken care of, whether that's the environment, whether that's indigenous people, whether that's a whole series of other things, and truthfully, that's often included women's issues. <laughs> um, you know, for me, I think it's less a matter of saying, you know, if we'd had women in charge of Lehman Brothers, it wouldn't have come to this, but it might be if we'd had a different set of social priorities and a different set of social orders, we might have had a different outcome. We, they, us, are more involved in teamwork and less ego, and, and of course there are examples that you can just prove the opposite, but less ego, more teamwork is so important. Yeah, and I think there's really strong evidence to suggest that it's not even having more women on the team, it's having a broader diversity of experiences because it's also about teams that have different ages, yeah. different socioeconomic backgrounds, different uh, approaches to education, different nationalities. We know the more you can have different uh, opinions and lived experiences and sort of intellectual starting points, the more robust teams yeah. are. And I think there's really strong evidence, you know, in the last couple of years that organizations that are managed by women have a much stronger orientation mm -hmm. to collaboration and teamwork. It's not always true, but it's yep. certainly the case. And I think, you know, when I look at my own organization, I know that having the kind of team I've built up, which is, you know, remarkably diverse, it also encourages that behavior to roll further down through the organization. So that becomes the model for what it should be rather than the exception. And I think that that's the place where there's hope, right? Is if you get diversity in sort of the sort of senior institutions, that starts to become the model for how things get done. And as that rolls down, that's also how you get change. Thank you so much. It's International Women's Day. Can I ask you, what do you think the key lessons were for you if you were going to give your advice to a younger woman? 
and the opportunities are there that you have to make up your mind for filling in your backpack for the mm. life journey then never think of short terms but think over a longer term and never pin yourself in one line and make it indeed um, possible that you can just act and react when uh, situations are changing and never give up so that would be my uh, advice the more education the better uh, look at the digital um, uh, world for it's fascinating and within a split second it is all digital so to say so complete change and it is indeed one of those challenging and fascinating yeah. worlds where we can do a lot so never give up and be independent in your relationship so just uh, stick to a relation when it is uh, built on love but not because it is comfortable and <laughs> go for yourself would you give any advice to your younger self i'm a tough a worker in in this field and i changed my mind uh, uh, even more than halfway so to say and and take the opportunity so i would do the same as i did but of course taking advantage of the opportunities and my experience in life of today cool yeah thank you thank you and I wish you a lot of luck for it. It's still a lot of luck. <laughs> well, and I wish you luck too, because we both have lots of work to do. Okay. Girl power. Absolutely. Yeah.